All right, so in this video, I'm going to take a look at the June 2012 Unit 1 paper. So let's get started with some particle physics. So we've got the k minus meson, it has a strangeness of minus 1. Uh, so let's uh, think about how they would achieve a charge of minus 1 must contain an anti-up. A strangeness of minus 1 means it contains a strange quark. So that would be your quark configuration. First question asks, more generally, state the quark composition of a meson, so it's uh, one quark and one anti-quark. So you want the baryon number of the K-minus meson. Well, it's a meson, not a baryon, so it has a baryon number of zero. What is the quark composition of K minus meson? Oh, well, you, I already did that. So to get to minus one, you always need an anti-up, and you're going to have a strange to give it a strangeness of minus one. Okay, continuing on. So we've got a Feynman diagram for a K of the strange quark. Um, what interaction is responsible for this decay. So we can see that there are no strange particles on this side, whereas there is one here. So strangeness hasn't been conserved, which means it must be the weak interaction that is responsible. So energy and momentum are conserved when the W minus particle is produced. Take two other quantities that are also conserved and one that is not. So uh, charge is conserved because it always has to be. Uh, baryon number is conserved. It always has to be. Uh, we could also have gone with lepton number, spin, and any of the fundamental things that must always be conserved. But as I said earlier, what's not conserved is strangeness. And that's how I knew it was the weak interaction that was responsible for it. If strangeness had been conserved, it would have been the strong interaction. Okay, so let's move on to the next part. Okay, so we've got equation for the decay of a K minus meson. Um, so we had the Feynman diagram. So we saw that a strange change into an up. So it's now, uh, so it's gone from being anti-up strange to being anti-up up, which is a pi zero. It's a pi because there's no strange and it's uncharged because the charge is going to cancel each other out. We had an electron and then we have an anti-electron neutrino to conserve electron lepton number. The nucleus of a particular atom has a nucleon number of 14 and a proton number of 6. What is meant by the nucleon number and the proton number? Um, so the nucleon number is the essentially the sum of the number of protons and neutrons. So that's what we've got there. Uh, that doesn't look like it. And then proton number is just the number of protons, also known as the atomic number. Okay, so this question seems fairly obvious and you're basically just rewriting the question, but uh, hey-ho, it's only worth one mark for the whole thing. Calculate the number of neutrons in this atom. So the nuclear number is 14, proton number is 6. That must mean there are 8 neutrons left behind. Calculate specific charge. So the specific charge is the charge divided by the mass. So it has 6 protons, so 6 times 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19. And its mass is 14 times by the mass of a nucleon. And once we put that in, we end up with number 
1 times 10 to the minus, not minus, ah, 10 to the power of 7 coulombs per kilogram. There's your final answer there. Okay, so let's continue on. So we've got the specific charge of the nucleus of another isotope. So it has the same number of protons, so the same charge, but has a higher specific charge. What is meant by an isotope? So isotopes have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. So the fact it has the same number of protons makes it the same element. Different number of neutrons is what changes the mass. And we can see it has fewer neutrons because we've got a higher specific charge. Okay, so then it wants us to calculate the number of neutrons we've got in here. So we used this before. It's charge over mass. So we get its mass is going to be the charge divided by the specific charge. Now we know what its charge is. It's got six protons still, so six times one point six times ten to the minus nineteen divided by 4.8 times 10 to the power of 7 is 2 times 10 to the minus 26. If we divide that by the mass of 1 so that's 12 nucleons 12 minus 6 is 6 neutrons. Okay, so that's how many neutrons we've now got. And like I said, we've reduced the number of neutrons there. Okay, so moving on to question 3. Uh, still more particle physics going on. Protons can interact with electrons by gravity and two other fundamental interactions. Label, identify these interactions and name the exchange particle. Um, so, in, another one is the fact that they're charged, so they can interact through the electromagnetic. In which the exchange particle is a virtual photon. Another is that they can interact with each other through the weak interaction because they are both fermions and the exchange particle would be a w plus w minus or a z boson there okay so that's your interactions you want to know the quark composition of a proton which is up up down so nice and straightforward so let's do into the next part so this next question wants us to identify and explain what is meant by, sorry, electron capture. So um, the particles involved are a proton in the nucleus and an electron in the inner shell. And what happens is a proton interacts with an electron through the weak force, forming a neutron and an electron neutrino. So let's get that down. All right, so that's what we've got there. So we've got the particles, where they are, the force they interact through and what's formed as part of it. So we've got electron capture. Okay, in the space below, draw a Feynman diagram representing electron capture. So going in, we have a proton. Going in on this side, we have an electron. Coming out, we've got a neutron. Coming out, we've got an electron neutrino. And we can see that on the left hand side going in we have a positive charge and coming out is neutral so the positive charge must be carried over by a W plus boson like this. Uh, we could have drawn it going the opposite direction with a W minus but this is conventionally how you draw it for electron capture because it's the proton that captures the electron so the exchange particle goes across that way that's how I think about it. Okay, so that concludes question three.
All right, so we're going to be looking at the photoelectric effect here. So we've got monochromatic light on cadmium. We've got electrons with a range of kinetic energies up to a maximum value released. And we've got the work function. So the first thing wants us to state what is meant by the work function. Um, so it's the minimum energy to remove an electron from the surface of the material. All right, so that's what we've got there. Um, so moving on to the next one, explain why the emitted electrons have a range of kinetic energies up to the maximum. Um, so the equation in its useful form is going to be the photon energy minus the work function. So the first thing is the light is monochromatic, which means one wavelength or frequency, which means one wavelength constant photon energy. The photons can only interact with one electron, so the maximum energy each electron can get will be that photon energy minus the energy it takes to actually emit it from the surface. And some of the electrons might be deeper in the material, um, so they won't have as much when they're actually emitted because it takes more work to get them emitted. So let's get let's write that down. All right, so that's what we've got in the first part. So we've got our general equation. We've got the light is monochromatic and the energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. So all the photons have the same energy. We also know that one photon can interact with one electron. So let's get that down, one-to-one -one interaction. So that's what we've got there. And that gives you why there's a maximum kinetic energy. And the final step is why is a range up to the maximum. So it's that some electrons are deeper in the material and it require more work to remove them. And that's what we've got as a final stage. So that completes that answer there. So we want us to calculate the frequency of light in giving your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. So we know that we've got the work function, we've got the Ke max. So using your our equation, so HF is equal to the work function plus Ke max. Let's grab those values. So we've got 4.07 electron volts. 0 0.07 times by 1.60 times 10 minus 19. I'm going to add on, I think it was 3.51, 3.51 1 times 10 to the minus 20. And then that gives us um, a value of, let's calculate that, giving us a value of this energy. And to go from go from energy to frequency, we divide by Planck's constant, which gives us a value of 1.04 times 10 to the 15 hertz. And it's three significant figures because all of the data we've used in the question was three significant figures. So that finishes off that question there. Okay, so let's move on. In order to explain the photoelectric effect, the wave model of radiation was replaced by the photon model. Explain what must happen in order for existing scientific theory to be modified or replaced with a new theory. So the first thing is your theory should make a testable hypothesis, which then must be tested and that test repeated by other people and to verify um, that the hypothesis works. So first of all, um, theory needs a testable hypothesis. And that's one of the problems with, uh, you might have heard of string theory at the moment, is they can't currently make it produce testable hypothesis, which is a massive problem. So that's the first stage. And then the next bit would be then the evidence needs to be collected. And then that evidence needs to be reproduced by other people to verify that it's correct. So that's the process that you go through. Obviously that's massively simplified it and this would take years, but that's the process. Okay, so let's move on to question five. 
Okay, so this question is going to be about AC circuitry. Um, so those of you on the new specification may not have done AC at this point because uh, it's now in year 13. Well, most people are now doing it in year 13. So if you're, that's the case, just skip over this. But if you have done AC and you're wanting to practice, let's crack on. So we've got alternating current supplies uh, an output voltage of RMS 12 volts and a frequency of 50 hertz. Describe how I'd use an oscilloscope to check the accuracy of the RMS output voltage and the frequency of supply. Um, so the first thing is when you want to check the voltage, you would turn the time base off. It makes your measurements much more straightforward. Um, so we're going to connect the voltage supply to the Y plates of your oscilloscope and turn the time base off. So let's start off with that. All right, so that's our starting point. So now what we're going to do is adjust the Y gain to make the line that's on the screen as long as possible in the screen. That, then we can measure the peak to peak voltage, divide that by two, divide that by root two, that would be the RMS. So let's put that down in words. Okay, so that's that part. And those of you wondering why we need to maximize the trace length, it's so it minimizes the percentage uncertainty in that measurement. So now we've got the RMS, we are going to turn the time base on, um, adjust it so we can see a full wavelength on the screen um, by looking at your time base or your x gain work out the time period and then frequency is one over the time period there so that's what we've got we're going to turn on the time base adjust it to view one full cycle and measure the wavelength and then we've got the time period and then the last thing is frequency is one over the time period and finally, what you'd do is you'd compare RMS frequency values to those stated. Because we were obviously asked to verify or check them. So the last thing we need to do is compare the values we'd obtained experimentally to the values stated. Okay, so that finishes that question. Okay, so continuing with the AC question we were looking at before, we've got a 12 volt, 24 watt lamp. Calculate the RMS current in the lamp. So, current is power divided by potential difference, 24 over 12, which is going to be. 2.0 amps and it wants the peak current so peak is just going to be that times by root 2 so it's 2 times by root 2 and that's going to give us a value of 2.8 amps Calculate the peak power of the lamp. Um, so that's just going to be uh, the the average times by two. There's going to be twelve times. No, sorry, twenty four times by two, which is forty eight watts. There. We could also have done it with. Uh, v peak and I peak multiplying, but that's effectively going to be times in by root 2 times in by root 2, which is multiplying by 2. So it's just much easier this way. Okay. Okay, so we've got a battery with zero internal resistance or negligible internal resistance. So we've got P and Q in parallel. We've got EMF of 12 volts. Okay. So the lamp is rated at 12 volts, 36 watts, and Q is 12 volts, 6 watts. So when it says rated, what it means is when it's supplied with 12 volts, it will produce 36 watts of power, 12 volts, 6 watts of power, respectively. We want to work out the current in the battery. So let's work out the current separately. So the current going through P is P over V, which is 3 amps. 
the current going through Q is 6 over 12 0.5 amps so your total current is going to be those values added together so it's going to be 3.5 amps there because we can see the current through P and the current through Q add together to give you the current through the battery. Calculate the resistance of P uh, so resistance is V squared over P. So the potential difference is 12, so 144. And the power was 36. So that's just going to be 4 ohms there. Putting those two together. All right, so let's move on to the next part. Calculate the resistance of Q again. Let's do V squared over P. So again, still 12 squared, but let's divide it by 6 this time. So 144 divided by 6 gives you 24 ohms there as your answer. Satan explain the effect of the on the brightness of the lamps in the circuit if the battery has significant internal resistance. Okay, so um, I'm going to explain this using the potential divider mechanism. Um, so let's think of the potential difference or the terminal voltage across the bulbs as the EMF minus the potential difference across the internal resistance. So now what's going to happen is the terminal voltage or the potential difference across the lamps is smaller because there is now a potential difference loss across the internal resistance and the effect of that is going to be the brightness decreases so let's write that down okay so let's review what i've got so we've got a potential loss now across the internal resistance this decreases the potential difference across the bulbs which decreases their power Therefore, the amount of energy they're transferring to light energy, if you like, is decreased. So their brightness is going to decrease. That's the different parts to explain that. Okay, so let's continue on. Okay, so we now, um, we've now got them connected in series. Um, explain why they would not be at their normal brightness. Um, so the key thing is the, how the current has changed. So having them in, adding things in series increases resistance so decreases current and therefore with well, their resistance is the same so the power is going to decrease so let's put that into words okay so let's review what we've got here so the brightness or the power is calculated using this equation so each of the individual bulbs resistance stays the same they're still the same bulb but the current through them decreases because we've now added series components which increases total resistance so therefore we conclude the brightness of them is going to decrease you could also use a potential divider argument and say each of them now only has six volts across it as opposed to 12 so again using v squared over r uh, but that's the way i've chosen to explain this one so it explain which of the lamps will be brighter, assuming that the resistance to the lamps does not change significantly with temperature. So we know the current through each of them is going to be the same. So what we need to think about is which one has the greatest resistance. Because again, we're looking at P is equal to I squared R. So this is what's going to explain it. Because like I said, the current is the same. is the same but we calculated the resistances already and we know that Q has a larger resistance and if we know the same current but larger resistance uh, therefore for power and brightness of Q 
is greater than that of P because of that greater resistance. Okay, so that finishes question six. Let's move on to the last question on this paper. So we've got two resistance in series, EMF of 12 volts and no internal resistance. So what we can see here is we're looking at a potential divider. The volt, reading on the voltmeter is eight volts and the resistance of R2 is 60 ohms. Calculate the current. So uh, firstly, so let's work out what V2 is, the potential difference across R2 is going to be 12 minus 8, which is 4.0 volts. That's the potential difference across R2. So then the current going through the resistor 2, and, and therefore around all the circuit, because it's a series circuit, is the potential difference divided by R. Is six four sorry it's four divided by sixty, which is um, six point seven times ten to the minus two amps there when you calculate it. Okay, so that's that part. Um, let's move on to the next one. Okay, we need to. Uh, Need to flip over the page. So we want to calculate the resistance of R1. So R1 is going to be V1 over I1, which is 8 divided by 0 0.066. Do, 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 do. 8 divided by the answer, 120 ohms for that one. We could also use the potential divider to work out, but this is more straightforward. Okay, the charge is passing through the battery in two minutes. Uh, so Q is I T, so it's 0 0.066 times by 2 times by 60. Um, so then we get 4 to 60, that gives you that answer, times by 2 times by 60, and that's 8. 0 0.0 coulombs and we're going to give that to two significant figures because the value we had here and the values we used to calculate it previously are all two significant figures and it's going to be measured in coulombs because it's charge. Okay so last part in the circuit shown the resistor 2 is replaced with a thermistor say and explain what will happen to the reading on the voltmeter as the temperature of the thermistor increases. So let's first look at what happens to the resistance as temperature increases. So as resist as temperature increases, resistance of a thermistor decreases. So let's put that on first. Okay, so we've got the same EMF, so the current in the circuit is going to increase. So the voltmeter is not across the thermistor, it's across the resistor. So we're going to use Ohm's law So the current is increased, the resistance of the resistor stays the same, so the voltmeter reading will increase. And that finishes off that line of argument, and therefore the paper itself. So I hope you found this useful going through these questions, how, how I break them down to answer them. If there's anything that's not clear, please do comment and let me know so I can clear that up for you. And as always, thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video and do look out for future stuff like this.